In this lesson, we're going to be understanding the concept of irrational numbers. The success criteria is, I can classify real numbers as rational or irrational, I can approximate irrational numbers, and I can solve real-life problems involving irrational numbers. An irrational number is a number that is not rational. So, an irrational number cannot be written as A over B, where A and B are integers and B is not equal to zero. Remember, rational means you can write it as a ratio of two integers, so irrational means you cannot write it as a ratio of two integers. Anyway, the square root of any whole number that is not a perfect square is irrational. The cube root of any integer that is not a perfect cube is irrational. Another example of an irrational number is pi. Every number can be written as a decimal. The decimal form of an irrational number neither terminates nor repeats. So for rational numbers, they either terminate, which means they end, or they repeat, which means that we could write a repeating sign. But irrational numbers neither terminate nor repeat. I'm going to scroll down here. Real numbers. Rational numbers and irrational numbers together form the set of real numbers. So in pink, we have the rational numbers. And then in blue, we have the irrational numbers. And within the rational numbers, there are other subsets. So I'm going to start with natural numbers. The natural numbers are the numbers that you can count, starting with 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Uh, whole numbers include 0 and all of the natural numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The integers include all of the whole numbers and their opposites. So now we can have negative numbers without a fractional or a decimal component when it's simplified. So negative 1, negative 2, 25 negative 500. Those are all integers. And then rational numbers, like we talked about before, can be written as a ratio of two integers. So 1 over 2, negative 2 thirds, 2.25, 0 0.3 repeating. So repeating decimals, terminating decimals, and fractions are all examples of rational numbers. Some examples of irrational numbers is the cube root of 7, because it's a cube root of a non-perfect cube, pi, the square root of 2, which is a square root of a non-perfect square, Negative 2 pi is an irrational number. So anytime you see a simplified expression with a pi in it, it's going to be irrational. And then the negative square root of 3, once again, we are taking a square root of a non-perfect square. So that's another example of an irrational number. And remember, we cannot write any of these as a ratio of two integers. For this example, we're going to classify each real number. So for part A, I see that we have the square root of 12. Well, this is going to be an irrational number irrational. And the reason is we're taking a square root of a non-perfect square. So I'm going to write 12 is not a perfect square. For part B, I have negative 0.25 repeating. And remember, repeating decimals can always be put into fraction form, which means that this is a rational number. And our reasoning is Repeating decimals are rational. For part C, I have the negative square root of 9. And the negative square root of 9 is actually equal to negative 3. So not only is this a rational number, it's also an integer. So I'm going to write both. Rational and integer. Okay, And once again, the reason is because the negative square root of 9 is equal to negative 3. And there's no fractional or decimal components to this. Anyway, for part D, I have the cube root of 15. And 15 is not a perfect cube, which means that this is going to be irrational. 15 is not a perfect cube. And then we have pi, and pi is going to be irrational as well. And the reason is, in decimal form, pi doesn't terminate and it doesn't repeat. So non-repeating and non-terminating. Anyway, now we're done with this one. For this example, we're going to approximate the square root of 71 to the nearest a integer, and then b, tenth. So first, we're going to start with the nearest integer. Okay, and I notice that I'm dealing with 71, the square root of 71. So I'm just going to write that down. And if I ignore the square root for a second, I know that 71 is above 64, which is a perfect square. If you remember, 8 squared is 64. 
So the square root of 71 is greater than 64, or I can write 64, the square root of 64, I should say, is less than the square root of 71, okay? And I also know that 71 is less than 81. 81 is a perfect square, and the square root of that would be 9. So if I do this, the square root of 71 is less than the square root of 81, okay? Now what I'm going to do is simplify these square roots. Well, the square root of 64 is just 8, and then the square root of 71 just stays the square root of 71. And then the square root of 81 is 9. So all this is saying is 8 is less than the square root of 71, and the square root of 71 is less than 9. So I know that the square root of 71 is in between 8 and 9. Now I just got to figure out which one it's closer to. Well, I know 71, if I do 71 minus 64, that's 7 away from 64. And then if I do 81 minus 71, that is 10 away. So 71 is closer to 64 than it is to 81. If we plotted these on a number line, 71 would be 10 units away from 81 and only 7 units away from 64. So I know that 71 is going to be closer to 8 because the square root of 64 is 8. So for part A, my answer is going to be 8. Now for part B, I'm going to approximate the square root of 71 to the nearest tenth. And I already know that the square root of 71 is in between 8 and 9. Okay. Now, I also know that it is a little bit closer to 8 than 9. It's 7 units away from 8 and 10 units away from 9, the, the squares of those, I should say. Um, so I'm going to try a number that's a little bit closer to 8, but not that much closer to 8. So I'm going to try 8.4. So I'm going to square 8.4 or do 8.4 times 8.4. And this is going to give me, well, 4 times 4 is 16. Bring up the 1. 8 times 4 is 32, plus 1. That's going to be 33. Bring down my 0. 8 times 4 is 32. Bring up my 3. 8 times 8 is 64, plus 3 is 67. Now I'm going to add these up. So I get 6, 5, 0. Bring up my 1, 7. And I'm going to move my decimal two spaces. So I know that 8.4 squared is 70.56, which is very close. But if you notice, this is a little bit too small. Okay, 71 is a little bit larger than 70.56. So what I need to do now is go to the next tenth, which would be 8.5, and I need to square that and see if that one's closer or farther away from 71 than 8.4 squared is. So I'm going to do 8.5 times 8.5. Well, 5 times 5 is 25. 8 times 5 is 40, plus 2 is 42, bring my 0, and I get 8 times 5 is 40 again, and then 8 times 8 is 64, plus 4 is 68. I add these up, 5, 2, 12, 7. So I'm going to move my decimal, two spaces, so I get 72.25, okay? Now, this is over... 1 away. This is 1.25 away from 71. This one is less than 1 away. This is only going to be 0 0.44 away from 71. So I know 8.4 is the better estimate because it's closer. So my nearest tenth approximation of the square root of 71 is 8.4. And now we're done with this one. Comparing irrational numbers. Which is greater, the square root of 35 or the cube root of 81? Well, what I'm going to do here is just figure out where these numbers are in between in terms of whole numbers, and then I can make my decision. So the square root of 35, I'm going to think of my perfect squares near 35. Well, I know 36 is a perfect square because 6 times 6 is 36. So if I write the square root of 35, I know that the square root of 36 is going to be a little bit larger than that. So I'm going to write the square root of 35 is less than the square root of 36. Okay. And then the other perfect square that's on the other end that's going to be lower than the square root of 35, that's going to be 25 because 25 is 5 squared. So I'm going to write 25, the square root of 25, I should say, is less than 35. So I know the square root of 25 is less than the square root of 35, and that's less than the square root of 36. So if I simplify my square roots, I'm going to get a 5 is less than the square root of 35, and that's going to be less than 6. And all I did is simplify my square roots here. 
Okay, so I know that the square root of 35 is somewhere in between five and six, and it's probably much closer to six, but let's see if we even need to do that. Now I wanna figure out where the cube root of 80 lies in between, okay? So now I'm gonna write the cube root of 80. Okay, now I wanna think of my perfect cubes near 80. Okay, well I know that the perfect cube below 80 is gonna be 64 because four cubed, or four times four times four is equal to 64. So I know I can write the cube root of 64 is less than the cube root of 80. Okay, and then I know that the larger one, if this one's gonna be four, the next one's gonna be five. And I know five cubed is 125. So I know that's gonna be in between so I can write the cube root of 125. And then when I simplify these, the cube root of 64 just turns into four. And that's gonna be less than our cube root of 80. And that cube root of 80 is gonna be less than, well, the cube root of 125 is gonna be five. So I know that the square root of 35 is in between five and six, but the cube root of 80 is only in between four and five. So this is gonna be four point something. This is gonna be five point something. So I know that the square root of 35 is greater than the cube root of 80. And now we're done with this one. For this example, we're gonna approximate the distance between the point negative four comma negative three and the point three comma negative five to the nearest 10th. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is plot these points. So I have negative four comma negative three, which is right here. And then I have three comma negative five. So three comma negative five. That is right there. And remember, when we are finding the distance between two ordered pairs, what we can do is draw a right triangle on our grid and then use the Pythagorean theorem. So to draw my right triangle, I can take either of my points and then line it up with another point. So I'm gonna take this and then go on this grid line until I'm lined up with this other point. So that's gonna be right here at the point negative four comma negative five. Now I'm gonna sketch my right triangle. And now I can use the Pythagorean theorem. Well, our distance is gonna be the hypotenuse because our right angle is right here. This is gonna be the longest side length as well. I know this is two units, so this is two. And then let me count this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is seven units, okay? So, and then I'll just call this C, okay? So I can use A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And then I can plug in two for A and seven for B. Once again, A and B doesn't really matter which one you plug in for. So I have two squared plus seven squared equals C squared. Okay, well two squared is four. Seven squared is 49. And that's gonna equal C squared. Okay, well right here, I just have to add four plus 49. That's gonna give me 53 equals c squared, and then to solve this equation, I'm just gonna rewrite this equation, 53 equals c squared, to show that we're gonna take the square root of both sides. And I don't need to take the negative square root here because I'm finding a distance, so I'll just take the positive square root of both sides. So I get c equals, well, the square root of 53, 53 is not a perfect square, so I'm just gonna leave it as the square root of 53. Okay, and now I need to approximate this to the nearest 10. So we're gonna do what we did in one of our previous examples in order to find out where the square root of 53 lies in between. So I know that 49 is a perfect square because I just did it out. Seven squared is 49, and that's gonna be less. So I'm gonna write right here, my square root of 53, and I know that the square root of 49 has to be less than that, and that's just a little bit less. So if this is gonna turn into seven, I know my next number is gonna be eight, which is also the square root of 64. So I know that the square root of 49 is less than the square root of 53, and the square root of 53 is less than the square root of 64. Okay, now I'm just gonna simplify these perfect squares. So I get seven is less than the square root of 53, and that's less than eight. Okay, so I know that my number has to be in between seven and eight. Well, if you notice, 53 is only four more than 49, and it is 11 less than 64. So it's much closer to 49 than it is to 64. So I'm gonna try a number that is closer to seven than it is to eight. So I'm thinking I'm gonna start with 7.2. So if I do 7.2 times 7.2, or 7.2 squared, I get two times two is four, and then two times seven is 14, and then I get 14 again, and then seven times seven is 49, plus one is 50. So I get four, eight, 
one, and five. So this is 51.84. All right, so this is below, but remember I wanna keep trying numbers until I get to one that's larger than 53, and then I can compare. So now I'm gonna try 7.3. So if I do 7.3 squared, or 7.3 times 7.3, three times three is nine, and I get 21, I get 21 again, seven times seven is 49, plus two, it's gonna be 51, and I add these, I get nine, two, three, and five, move my decimal. All right, so 53.29 is above 53, but notice how it's much closer to 53 than 51.84 is. This is 1.16 away from 53. This is only 0.71 away. So 7.3 is going to be the better estimate. And remember, now that I have one number that's above and one number that's below, I know that this is gonna be my answer. So the best approximation for this distance between the two points is gonna be about 7.3 units. Anyway, we've used the Pythagorean theorem and then approximated our square root, and now we're done with this one. The equation d squared equals 1.37h represents the relationship between the distance d in nautical miles, you can see with a periscope, and the height h in feet of the periscope above the water. About how far can you see when the periscope is three feet above the water? Well, first thing I'm gonna do is write down my equation. So I have d squared equals 1.37. And I know that h represents my height of the periscope above the water, and that's gonna be three feet. So what I can do is I can take this three feet, I forgot to write my h here, and then plug this three feet in to h. So if I plug this into h, I'm gonna get d squared equals 1.37 times three. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is just multiply this out. So I have 1.37 times three, I get 21, I get nine plus two is 11, and then three plus one, that's going to be four. And I'm gonna move my decimal twice. So I get d squared equals 4.11. Now to solve this equation, what I wanna do is take the square root of both sides because I have this square happening to my variable here. And I don't care about the negative square root here because remember d represents distance and I can't have a negative distance. So I'm gonna take the square root of both sides, just the positive one, and I'm just gonna rewrite it. You don't have to do this. So take the square root of both sides, and then I'm gonna get D equals, well, now I wanna approximate what the square root of 4.11 is. Well, if you notice, 4.11 is super close to four, and I know four is a perfect square. Okay, so 4.11, if I take the square root of that, that's gonna be very close to two. So actually I'm gonna change my equals to approximately. So this is gonna be about two. Now, if we check with the calculator, I'm gonna type in the square root of 4.11, and I get 2.027. So even if I was estimating to the nearest 10th, it would still be 2.0. So our estimation of two, and our unit is gonna be nautical miles, is a very good estimation. So anyway, we have successfully figured out the distance that, that the periscope can see when it's three feet above water, which is two nautical miles, and now we're done.